All right. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for Group I uh, for having me speak today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, if you are not familiar with the group of, with the group by code of conduct, you can go take a look at that. Uh, the link is below. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what what to say about this, but there is no toleration of harassment of any form, and I'm glad to hear that they're making this as open and welcoming as possible for everybody. My name is Jared Poche. Um, this topic is every milliseconds counts, and this is a basically a a walkthrough of some work that I did a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, optimizing a particularly uh, interesting stored procedure that runs uh, a couple hundred million times a day for us. So I work for Channel Advisor, which is an e-commerce company. Um, I've been working with SQL Server now for about 20 years. Uh, if you count my time uh, teaching on the front end, I started off teaching certification classes for a community college. And then I worked for Microsoft for 10 years. And now I've been working with uh, Channel Advisor for several, and I've got uh, one of my coworkers is actually speaking on the other track in the next session, Mala. Um, if you want to follow up with me later on, I've got my, my Twitter handle will be mentioned later as well, um, but I've got links for my Twitter and my LinkedIn and uh, my GitHub where I'm sharing the slide deck and all of the uh, examples that I'll be going through for the session. So uh, every millisecond counts. This is a case study in tuning a frequently run procedure to less than one millisecond in duration. Um, so expectations for the, for this course. So this is sort of an intermediate to advanced uh, performance troubleshooting uh, session. Uh, I found this work really interesting because it was not standard uh, query tuning. We're not looking for the missing index or the table scan. It's nothing that obvious. We had to poke around a little more to find the opportunities for this stored procedure. Um, I want you to see kind of the the attention to detail and the, the little things that we picked up on to find some of these uh, opportunities here. I'm hoping that you will learn some coding techniques um, or approaches that you haven't seen before. And I want to remind you to think about what's going on outside of the database as well, because that's going to inform what's happening inside the database. So foundations and topics, there are a lot of things that come up uh, during the course of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and define some terms and make sure we're all on the same page. So. All of this is about troubleshooting or, or tuning one stored procedure, and this is an upsert procedure. So we're trying to update or insert a number of rows inside a given table, usually a small number of rows, probably like one to five the vast majority of the times. Um, and I'll, uh, there's a blog post I'll be sharing about uh, some other uh, some methods for dealing with upsert procedures in general, uh, a really good blog post on that by Aaron Bertrand. This is kind of a uh, specialized offshoot of one of the types that he identified. Um, table variables. I wanted to talk about table variables because we use them a lot in, in my environment. Uh, table variables get uh, a lot of smack talked about them <laughs> in a lot of the blog posts and stuff I see in the community, um, largely because table variables don't have statistics. So when they're compared with temp tables, frequently temp tables are going to produce um, better, better performance because the SQL Server has more information to run on and can make better decisions in optimizing them. Well, we use them for a couple of things. One, we use table valued parameters a lot. So rather than having a call to a given procedure update one row in a given table and having to then call that stored procedure 50 times, we'll pass in a TVP and basically provide uh, a, a table valued parameter with 50 rows worth of information to the procedure. So we can go and update 50 rows at a time. Uh, this leads to a lot fewer round trips and a lot less blocking or uh, buffer latch issues between uh, different threads operating in the same space. But um, we also use memory optimized table variables and memory optimized TVPs. Uh, basically, in all of our cases at this point, um, the advantage of having it be memory optimized is it's a lot faster. And table variables like temp tables are actual objects that are created in tempdb. Well, both of them can run into the same issue with tempdb contention if you're creating objects very, very quickly. Not so with memory optimized table variables and memory optimized TVPs. Um, one of the things I ran across in looking at the execution plan is I ran across a table spool. A table spool is a case where SQL Server is queuing up basically a set of results from, from part of an, a given statement or operation, and it saves them off in a temporary storage somewhere so it can refer to them typically multiple times later. So we run into a table spool at one point, and it is one thing that does get my attention, makes me look a little closer at the execution plan. Um, indexed views. 
Uh, views are pretty straightforward. A view is basically just a, a, a SQL statement that we've defined that goes against multiple objects and produces a set of data, or we can query against the view. In this case, I did run against an indexed view. So we had an index created on a view so that the data defined by that view is actually being stored as a, as a separate object. I saw somebody uh, actually was replying to Brent Ozar a while back on Twitter and referred to, said that indexed views were separate objects populated by a trigger. And I, I liked the way he said that, it was very funny. So I ran across an indexed view in this and that was another thing that got me asking questions. But of course, every time we update any of the underlying tables, we have to update the data that we've stored for the indexed view as well. So it's just another layer of overhead on our operation. We also talk about the Halloween problem, and this is probably something you could talk about for an hour separately, and I'm not going to. Um, the Halloween problem popped up in our in our um, evaluation of the update statement. Um, I've written a blog post about it. I've actually referenced a series of blog posts by Paul White that goes into a lot more detail. But the Halloween problem is something that we ran into where uh, SQL Server tries to protect you from having an update statement update the same information update the same row multiple times when it's operating in row by row fashion. So we'll talk about the Halloween per, uh, problem and Halloween protections later on. Uh, this is a problem that can, that affects SQL Server but also uh, other database management systems as well. So like I said this was a case study in tuning a specific stored procedure uh, where I work. Unfortunately, I'll be working with anonymized execution plans because I can't share, say, the actual code for it. But this is part of my company, which does e-commerce. This is part of our inventory management. And specifically, it's in the part that's updating quantity for customers, uh, for what, for items that customers have for sale. Uh, the stored procedure updates multiple rows in the underlying table by using a table valued parameter, which is passed into the procedure. Uh, the table tracks quantity, like I said, and each item may have multiple records depending on how many distribution centers it is present in. Updates are customer driven. Um, when they're making a sale uh, or reporting a sale to us, when they get new stock in, they send updates to us through a variety of methods. And in some of these methods, they might be um, updating multiple times with the same information. They might be doing it on a, on a fixed schedule. So we're getting updates, a large number of them throughout the day, and we've got to write them out as quickly as possible. This stored procedure when I started working on it was taking 3.1 milliseconds on average. And all the numbers and times and executions that I'll mention are actually coming from Query Store. We use this in our production environment all the time. Um, I've, I really didn't use Query Store much before, we, before I came to Channel Advisor, and now it would be difficult to do without. Um, if it's only taking 3.1 milliseconds, you might ask why we would bother trying to improve its performance. That's because we were running at 285 million times a day when I started working on it. And a couple months later when I was finished, we were up to 350 million executions a day. Now this is across hundreds of databases, of instances of this database running the same schema and same procedures. Uh, across dozens of servers. So that makes the numbers sound less crazy, but um, there's a lot going on here. And the, the initial goal of this is I wanted to see if I could take the stored procedure and get it to run in one millisecond less time. A small gain, but would be multiplied so many times that it would be really considerable. So what does the procedure do? And like I said, I can't share the actual code for it, but I can tell you there's only a few things really going on here. One, there's a quick query that populates a few variables that really doesn't take enough time to be concerned about. Second, we check for item listings and we aggregate that information. So what is an item listing? Well, let's say we've got 20 of a given item for sale, but we've got five of them already posted on one specific uh, place, say eBay. We've got five of them already posted for sale on eBay. Well, that means we've kind of only got 15 that are available because five are spoken for. So there's a quick check to see if we have any listings for a given item and where they are and aggregates that information so we can subtract those numbers back up later. Um, then we have the update to the base table itself. This takes about 80% of the runtime of the stored procedure. So whatever we end up doing here, at some point we're gonna have to look at that update statement and make some gains there. And second, this is an upsert procedure. So we try to update the underlying row in the base table, and if it doesn't exist, then we've got it inserted afterwards. 
uh, I did find out that this has a trigger that leads to an insert on another table as well. So we have to keep all of that in mind. So here's a portion of the execution plan. This is us hitting the multiple underlying objects and filtering things and joining things. And here's the rest of it. Actually, I'm gonna tap over to uh, Management Studio at this point so that I can show you the execution plan and zoom around a little bit more. So here's my update statement, anonymized. And if we look at this, I did say at the beginning that you know there's no index scans or no nothing really obvious that should be a problem. And you might see if you're following along here, oops, no, let's not do that. We do have an index scan here. Now this is a scan of one of the memory optimized table variables. And I know that this, uh, that this table variable is going to typically have one to five rows in it. It's going to be unlikely to be more. The row count here in the estimated plan says one of one. So scanning that is not exactly our problem here. Um, also, we have another index seek down here that is also using another uh, memory optimized table variable and a third here. So um, these are not really the problem. So what else is going on? Well, we've got this is actually an index seek against the underlying base item, the object seven. This is our main table. We have another index seek against it here and a key lookup here. And I always like to get rid of key lookups whenever I see them, I will frequently target them. Um, but it is interesting that we're hitting the underlying table three different times, in part because we're doing a full join up here. But why do we have a non-clustered index seek there and there? That's a bit interesting. But you might also notice there's just a lot of operations here. Most of them are saying, one row or zero. Um, we've got some concatenations, we've got some joins, but uh, there's a lot going on, but it's kind of hard to see that any of these are particularly expensive. Now, if I go a bit left here, once we've joined everything together, we've got, we're sorting our information, we're going through, we get to the point where we do the clustered index update. Okay, that's 22% of our cost. This is also unusual. Usually if there's a, a well-tuned DML operation, if we're writing data, the most expensive thing is typically the operator that's actually writing the data. In our case, it's only 22% of the cost, which again says to me, there's a lot going on. So now we have a table spool here, and this was something that originally got my attention. So we have an eager spool here, and what's going on is we're, we're saving the results at this point so that we can refer back to them a couple of other times. And you'll frequently see this when you are updating multiple non-clustered indexes, but this one got a little odd to me. So after we have that spool, we have a sort operator and we are doing a different index seek and we're computing scalars and we've got another sort and then we do another clustered index update. And I must admit to a certain amount of confusion here for a moment, until I realized, oh wait, we've got a indexed view. And what we're trying to do is we're updating that index view. So all this work on this middle line here, this, the additional sorts, the index seek, and the second clustered index update is we're updating that indexed view. This looks like a big tax on my update operation here. And we're doing this hundreds of millions of times a day, every time we're having to update that view as well. So that was something that got my attention. And that was kind of the first thing I thought of when I, when I was uh, trying to figure out how we could actually improve the performance here. So the first thought was that view, uh, the table spool and that view. What do we, do we really need to have that view or do we really need to have that view indexed? If we don't have it indexed, we don't have to update it all these times and that could save us an awful lot of effort. Uh, once I came to that thought, I had a couple of other that popped in my head. First of all, every run through the stored procedure, we run the update statement and then we run the insert. Well, logically, you're going to insert a record one time and update it many, many times uh, for the life of that for the life of that item. How many of the times are we running the insert statement when it's completely unnecessary? And one of the things I, I, I didn't realize before this as well is if you run an insert statement and it's filtered in this case to make sure that the object that the item doesn't already exist in the underlying table. If you run an insert statement and it inserts zero rows, you're still going to run the trigger that's associated with that table. 
So that's another layer of work that we don't really need to do in this case. So my thought was if we're, is there any way for us to update the table and then determine whether we need to run the insert or not, and maybe just skip that. Third, the thought about table variables and the idea that table variables are, are not as good as temp tables because temp tables have statistics and the optimizer can make better decisions on it. Well, what if there's something to that? What if I tried taking out the table variables and put in temp tables and said to see if that would give the optimizer more information to work with and it might make better decisions? We tried that out. And then the last thing was the update statement itself. Like I said, this is 80% the cost of the stored procedure, and you've already seen the execution plan for that. So there's a keylookup operator in that, I'm not thrilled with that. And there's multiple references. We're doing two non-clustered indexes for it. Why is that? There's gotta be some, some way we can improve things in this area. Do we have any questions so far? Not yet. I hope I'm not going too fast. Yeah, All, right. All right, so the, the first thing that I was thinking about was the indexed view and it was like, well, do we need the view? Probably, but do we need it to have it indexed? And so I went and look, looked into it. So we're updating the view every time we update the underlying stored procedure. And as I said, the DML operators tend to be the most expensive thing in a, in a given uh, operation. So I looked up the view and all the view was doing is doing a little bit of aggregation for us. Now, as I said, an item is going to have multiple rows based on any uh, how many distribution centers it's present in. But in most cases, it's gonna be like one to five uh, rows for a given item giving its quantity. So the view is just aggregating those few rows so that we can read one row and get one quantity number instead of reading three. Didn't seem like a huge benefit for us to, to be able to read one row instead of three or five. So I, at that point, I decided, let's try removing the index. I didn't really have a frame of reference for how, how much faster this was going to be or how much that was costing us. But we removed that index and based on what day you measured it from, because it varies a bit from day to day, we reduced the total runtime for the procedure by about 20%. Now, initially I was trying to reduce the runtime by one second, this got us 60% of that in the first step. So this was a big win for us, and we moved forward from there with the next idea. So we're using memory optimized table variables. There's a couple of table variables inside the stored procedure, plus one memory optimized TVP that's passed into the procedure. So if the lack of statistics can lead to bad plans, maybe replacing this with temp tables would give us uh, better plans and we would see better performance. This was kind of this offer, this uh, this attempt was kind of putting more things on the optimizer to see what it would do, and it turns out by the flames on this slide that this was a really bad idea. <laughs> so this actually caused the the stored procedure to have a lot of TempDB contention and to take longer to run. Um, TempDB contention is something that you, there's a there's a lot of blog posts about TempDB contention, and a lot of them I think focus on one of two things, which is either oh you should probably be using this trace flag, or you should be creating additional physical files inside TempDB so it can do these writes in parallel. One of the things that I think gets understated is if you're having TempDB contention, create fewer things in TempDB. Uh, and in our case, if you're running a stored procedure hundreds of millions of times a day and you're creating like four temp tables in it. That's an awful lot of temporary objects that you're creating over the course of a day. So in our case, at our scale, this just didn't work. I reverted this change and we back, went back to our table variables. So my, uh, my final answer on that one is memory optimized table variables are pretty hard to beat. And if you see that you're getting a bad execution plan, either we're using a bad index or, or joining things in an order you wouldn't prefer, I'd much rather give SQL Server a hint to encourage it to move in the direction I would expect it to. So this was a case of something not to do. Next, we looked at, um, I looked at the fact that this was an upsert procedure and was wondering whether we needed to run the insert statement every time through or how much of the time we didn't need that. So um, we try to update the row. If it doesn't exist, we'll uh, run the insert statement. Um, it seemed pretty simple to me in this case that if our TVP passes in five rows and we run our update statement and the update statement affects five rows, then there's nothing for us to insert. 
So simply just basing, just with that simple logic based on the row counts for the TVP and our update operation, we had a path to skip around the insert statement. When I did this, we went from running the insert 350 million times a day to 6 million. So that was really pleasing to see. What was curious about it is the runtime for the stored procedure didn't actually drop that much. It went from 1.95 milliseconds to 1.91. This still adds up to 14,000 14, seconds of runtime per day. And while it's a small gain, it was still a gain. We also reduced the executions of the trigger by a similar amount. So that saves like another 16,000 seconds of runtime a day. Um, what I figured out now uh, since then, which is really impressive, is how effective SQL Server was at filtering out rows and, and coming to the conclusion that it had zero rows to operate on, at which point the insert operation uh, completed really quickly because it had no rows to operate on. So that statement completed very quickly. And um, so again, like I said, this was a small gain, but it was a gain. At which point um, we've kind of gotten the low hanging fruit and I have to go back to the really complicated update statement to see what we could do with this. So the first thing, um, this is actually, there's two update statements in this and we either run uh, update A or update B, depending on some of the parameters that are passed in. They're very similar though. Uh, the update statement had two common table expressions. In it. And pardon me, not sure why that is not going away. The, we had a redundant common table expression on our update statement. So what we were doing is I mentioned there was a statement earlier on in the procedure that checks for listings and aggregates them and gives us a number for how many, how much of our quantity is already outstanding. Okay, well, the common table expression was reading from that table variable, that memory optimized table variable, and aggregating the rows from it to give us one quantity number. But we had already get aggregated the number. So the common table expression was unnecessary. So I removed it. The second common table expression uh, was querying the underlying table and was doing a bit of case logic on the quantity to deal with whether we're, you know, setting the value to a specific, specific number or if we're adding a number to the quantity that is already present. At any rate, we have this case logic in the common table expression, but we're querying the underlying table. The main body of the update statement is also querying the table. That's why we had three references to the underlying table. One of them was an index seek that was part of the common table expression. The other two were an index seek in the main body of the update, and then a key lookup to get some of the things that weren't covered by that index. So I looked at the case logic. There was some case logic present in the common table expression and some more in the update. So I just kind of combined the two cases, got rid of the common table expression and removed one of the references to the underlying table. So now instead of having two CTEs, we just have an update statement with a little bit of case logic around the set. Um, second, we had a key lookup. And like I said, I like to look for key lookups as an opportunity to improve performance. So I looked at the non-clustered index we're using and I found that it was an index based on the account ID, the item ID, and the distribution center ID. And then I looked at the clustered primary key and it was based on the account ID, the item ID, and the distribution center ID. So the first three columns were the same and those were the most important things for us to be looking for. At which point, I put a hint on the update to just use the clustered primary key to begin with. Then we don't have to go through the non-clustered index and then do key lookups for every row we find. Let's just go directly to the primary key because we're gonna to have to go there anyway. All of these went out at the same time and this led to a 28% reduction in the runtime for the stored procedure. It saved us about half a millisecond and multiplied by 350 million executions. That was 189 thousand seconds a day. So um, we seem to be having, there seem to be a lot of chat messages. Do we have any questions? Going once, going twice, sold. <laughs> so this is what my execution plan looked like after the changes, getting rid of the indexed view was definitely part of this. But getting rid of the redundant 
common table expressions, uh, applying a hint so that we're not using the non-clustered index. We ended up with this much smaller, much sleeker execution plan. And now the clustered index update that was 22% of the cost of the statement before is now 73% of the cost. The update didn't get more expensive. We just trimmed that much of the unnecessary work that was going on in the statement. Um, now, at this point, we had reduced the runtime from 3.1 milliseconds to 1.4. I was trying to reduce it by one millisecond, so we're way beyond that at this point. But we had an additional idea, which was, what if we're doing updates that are unnecessary as well? We know from other parts in our system that customers will, will upload the same information multiple times. Um, someone is raising their hand. Okay, forgive me for a moment. There was one question about whether. You know, you're doing fine. The uh, conversations in the chat were people asking about, you know, they're a newbie work and they get information on, uh, on doing performance tuning. And I let them know Brain Fritchie's book is a good one. Oh, okay. I would, I would definitely go with that. I've uh, had some really good conversations with Grant. Uh, we actually had him come to uh, Channel Advisor one day and discuss Query Store and other stuff with us. So that was very cool. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. I just didn't want you to. I didn't. Want I just you saw there were a lot of things going up there, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, running past. Yeah, no, you're doing fine, buddy. Thanks. Okay. So the new, the second idea was, or the final idea was, are do we have unnecessary updates? If people are uploading the same information to us time and time again, are we just updating the same quantity value to the same quantity value over and over again. And if so, how can we improve things? So the thought we had was a simple one, which let's just put a where clause on the update statement. And that basically says, let's update the record only if the new quantity and the old quantity are different. And it... Turns out that that was a terrible idea because this is where we ran into something called the Halloween problem. So I'll take a couple minutes for this. The Halloween problem was something that was identified in the late 70s by engineers at IBM. So this is not SQL Server specific, this is database management specific. Um, there's, actually a, there's actually a Wikipedia page for the Halloween problem, uh, albeit a small one. And the original problem was they were trying to, they were giving out raises to people in a part of the company that were making less than $25,000 a year. And they were gonna increase their salary by 10%. What they found was it updated some of them by 10% over and over until they had a salary above 25,000. Updating the same row multiple times, which is clearly not the intent of the operation. So the Halloween problem is at least a little famous. Um, I identified it in this case uh, because one of my coworkers looked at it with me. I was seeing a very strange execution plan once we added that where clause and our update started taking longer. It was taking like 50% longer. It was, really, it was really significant. And uh, Kevin Fiesel, who works with me, looked at it and said, this sounds like the Halloween problem. I believe I had read about it before, but I had never actually seen it live. And this can affect any DML state. This can affect inserts, updates, deletes and merges. In our case on this update statement, what I was doing was kind of a prime example of how to create the Halloween problem. <laughs> because the set in my update statement, I'm setting the quantity, but my where clause is also filtering based on the quantity. So what can happen if the, if the uh, database system doesn't take this into account, you can update a row, it might end up moving inside whatever index it's in, only to have the uh, the database system continued processing, hit that same row later on and update it a second time. So the idea, and to avoid this, you don't want to be changing the thing that you're querying based on. SQL Server doesn't allow the, the Halloween problem to happen. It has protections in place, but these protections typically amount to inserting a blocking operator into your statement. And the blocking operators are bad for performance. It's, it's causing us to suddenly not operate in the normal row by row fashion. And uh, 
So what I had observed was SQL Server put its protections in place, had an eager spool in the middle of my execution plan, and now my, and now my statement is taking longer. So uh, this is bad for performance and we wanna get rid of it. Now, what SQL Server is trying to do basically is to separate the reading of the data in this table from the writing of the data in this table. It wants to read all of the data, get one list of all of the rows it needs to update at once, and then go and update them. So my thought was, why don't we just completely separate those two operations? And I have found out since that this is not a new idea, but this is called the, this is called like manual Halloween protections. What if we wrote a query to get all the data we need from the underlying table and the TVPs that it's related to? Take that data and we put it into, well, not a temp table, that would be terrible. What if we put that into a memory optimized table variable? Do all the math, we could put into that table the new quantity value and the old quantity value. Then we could later check the results by querying our new, uh, our new memory optimized table variable. If we don't see any records where we're actually going to change the quantity, then we completely skip the update statement. We don't even run it. Uh, this also meant we had to change the logic for our insert statement because our conditional there was based on the row count of the update. And now we might be in a space where we retrieve, where we re receive five rows from code that we're supposed to update or insert. We might now update zero rows and insert zero rows. So we had a similar query based on a left join uh, instead of using the add at row count. Part of my concern here was by adding another TVP, we would be add and adding a statement to populate it and another statement to read it for the insert and the update, whether we'd be adding too much overhead to our stored procedure, but I, did, I needn't have worried. Populating the memory optimized table variable, querying two other TVPs and the physical table, took between 100 and 90 and 100 microseconds. I didn't have a frame of reference for this either beforehand. Checking the results, so querying the TVP um, took 10 to 20 microseconds. Because of this and because of how much redundant data is being passed into us, we ended up skipping the update statement 96% of the time. This brought the average runtime for the stored procedure down to 320 microseconds. And that calls for a victory dance in my book. Uh, I was rather pleased with myself. Now, um, because we're working, because I can't show you the actual code and stuff, I don't have a, a real example that I can show you of this, but I do have a made up example that I have based on the AdventureWorks 2014 database. So I have uh, restored this database from backup already. And of course, AdventureWorks is publicly available. So I wanted people to be able to have an example they could actually work with and look at themselves. So if you take that database and restore it, well, if we're gonna use memory optimized objects, we're going to need to add a memory optimized file group and add at least one file to that file group, which I have already done. We're also gonna to need to create a couple of memory optimized types. I'm creating two here that are create type statements, memory optimized is on. We've got a couple of columns in each and an index. We've got a couple more columns in the second one. And all of the numbers that I've been talking about that give you the time and the details down to the microseconds and all of these huge execution counts, all of that comes straight from query store. So I'm turning query store on in this database as well. So here is a stored procedure that I wrote to update the details of a given sales order. So we'll take in a sales order. We'll take a look at the status of that sales order. We don't really do anything with that, but. I have two update statements and we either do a relative update or a absolute update. This is similar to what my proc was doing. If we're doing a relative update, we take the information that's passed in, uh, the order quantity and the unit price for the items in this order. We will update all of those to match what's in the TVP. If we do an absolute update, we will update them and also potentially delete part of the order if it's not in the TVP that's passed in. Third, we will try to insert any items that are not in the underlying table. So if there's something in the TVP passed in um, and we don't see that product ID in this order currently, we will add it. 
So this is kind of, this stored procedure is doing the job straight and it's operating as my stored procedure was when I started off. Here's the modified procedure. Now, what this is going to do is instead of just going straight into doing an update, it's going to query data from the TVB that's, the TVP that's provided and the underlying table, and it stashes all this in a memory optimized table variable. We then query what's in the table variable to decide whether we need to run the, the insert, the update, or the delete. For both of the updates, we check to see if the price or the quantity changed for any of those items. If it didn't, we don't run the update. If it did, we go through and we run the update. Um, if we are, after we've populated this, the delete statement checks to see whether a given row, whether the information from the new fields, which come from the TVP, if those are null, meaning the TVP didn't have a record for this item. If the TVP didn't have a record for this item, we don't want it to be part of the order anymore, and we delete it from the underlying table. If the current values are null, that means it's not in the physical table, but it's in the TVP, in which case we need to insert it. If we don't see anything that matches that, we don't run the insert at all. So those are our two stored procedures. And this is, this loop is going to, our, this is going to create the table, look for a specific sales order ID, get the details from it and store that into a memory optimized table variable. I'm then going to run the stored procedure and tell it, hey, set all the values to what they're already set to. So I'm gonna run the normal procedure and then I've got to roll back after it just to make sure I don't actually change anything. And you could, you could take this example and you could work with it and modify it so it's actually you know, changing the unit prices or stuff and you could see the effects on the performance from there. I'm rolling back the transaction here just to make sure everything stays the way it is. Then I run the same information into the modified procedure that is detecting whether we need to do the updates or not. And I have typically run this multiple times. I've found that my example here, for whatever reason, gets cold cache issues very badly. So the first execution tends to be a lot slower. I ran this earlier and I went ahead and I ran it 200 times to get us a nice even number. So here's my query in query store. It's retrieving information for all of the statements in either object that have run within say the last 30 minutes. So let me zoom in on the results here. So here is the original stored procedure that just goes through and updates everything and inserts everything. There's a delete statement, there's a insert statement, and there's an update statement. Now the delete and the insert statements are running very quickly in 71 and 105 microseconds on average. But neither of those is actually making changes. So what's happening is it's filtering it out, realizing there's nothing to operate on, and the insert operator and the delete operator don't actually have any work to do. Now the update operator is taking, well, the update statement is taking three and a half milliseconds, which is not terrible. But the modified procedure is detecting whether we need to do an insert or an update and if you look in the actual statements, you don't actually see the delete statement and you don't actually see the insert. What we do have instead is we have this statement that is populating the table variable. Now this is an extra cost. We're not doing this on the original procedure. We also have this statement that checks to see whether the current value in the table is null. If so, we're gonna insert it. So this is the logical check we do before our insert statement. Here we check to see whether any of, the, any of the values change, whether the prices or the quantities changed. This is the logical check before our update statement, which we then don't run. And this checks to see if the new value from our TVP is null. So if the value in our TVP is null, but it's in the base table, we wanna delete it from the base table. So this is the logical check before our delete statement. The check before our insert takes nine microseconds. The check before our delete takes nine microseconds. The check before our update takes 15, and it took us 61 microseconds to populate the table. So we're ultimately comparing three and a half milliseconds to update the table when we don't really need to versus uh, 76 microseconds to figure out we don't need to do that. 
Uh, so we have a, a question about uh, concurrent updates from different sessions affecting yes. the same. And what is the question? Uh, so uh, what about concurrent updates from different sessions affecting the same sales order detail? After you select the record, it may get updated by a different process before yes. the update or? Yes. Yeah. So that that's definitely a thing. And that's one of the real benefits I, that we have from using procedures that instead of trying to update one row are taking in um, memory optimized TVPs and receiving basically a, a small temp table, a, a table variable full of multiple rows of data. So A, that helps because if you're trying to update a given order, you can make one stored procedure call that updates everything for that order. So we have a lot less concurrency in places in, in our environment because we use these kinds of uh, these kinds of stored procedures made to use TDPs and update multiple rows at a time. Um, like I was saying earlier, we could be making 50 stored procedure calls to update 50 rows in our table, or we can make one. One is a huge benefit because we're not blocking our uh, we're not blocking ourselves. But second, more than that, so even what if we have multiple threads going on in parallel, updating different uh, different orders? We could still get some uh, stepping on each other's toes because if we're ultimately trying to lock a given page in memory, and we're doing this very, very quickly, you could see some buffer latch issues uh, even there, but we're, we're, we're pushing back the point where we start hitting concurrency issues a lot by using TVPs for one. Um, but if we get to, but if we're doing this kind of operation where we're detecting whether we need to do an update or not, we're going to make those a lot less likely because what if we're not writing the update at all? Well, then we can't possibly be blocking one of our other concurrent threads. So there's a real benefit in concurrency to me, A, by using the TVPs, and B, by intelligently deciding whether we need to do an operation or not. Um, um, somewhat relatedly, I actually had the question about um, what isolation level is involved here? Um, and was, was it running under the normal standard read committed and was RCS read committed high snapshot high? isolation level? Okay. Yeah. So we, we use that in our, on our main environment, in our main databases. And I'll tell you this, it took me, a, uh, <laughs> I've been working at Channel Advisor since 2016. And I think that was something I noticed the absence of, but it took me quite a while. I was like, we're really busy in this environment. There's there's some big numbers that we're throwing around. We're doing a ton of third procedure calls. Why aren't we troubleshooting blocking constantly? And it's like, oh, we're running recommitted snapshot isolation level. So we basically don't have, uh, there, there's an awful lot of blocking that just goes out the window because we're using that snapshot isolation level. So uh, that's a major benefit too. Nice. So, any other questions for the moment? I've got one more example, and I've got a few more things to share. So, this is the these were the numbers from Query Store for my local example. I also, when I was talking about the update statement, I was talking about case logic, and I was talking about common table expressions, and I kind of wanted to give a, a more concrete example just to make it clear what I did there. Uh, the one where I realized we were aggregating data that was already aggregated was simple enough, I just deleted that. But what I did find in my update statement originally is that it was something like this. We have a common table expression where we're reading in a bunch of data and we're applying case logic to it to come out with some you know, uh, fixed uh, final value from, this, uh, from our common table expression. And then our main query is reading from that and doing too much work because we're then applying another level of uh, case logic on top of that to, to produce, you know, more final numbers. And what this meant is, what this required us to do is to read from the sales order detail table twice. Well, that is just more work. So what I, what I did is I took the information from the two sets of case statements, kind of wrote it all down on a piece of paper, ironed it out and figured out one set of case statements that I could, uh, Set the, lot, set the quantity updates and whatever else we're updating in that table. And now we have one read against the underlying table instead of two. So contrived example, but I wanted to give, I wanted to give uh, something a little more concrete to go with, the, uh, with what I was saying there. 
And again, because uh, because I think about these things, and I love talking about performance topics, but uh, I, I maybe I think maybe I uh, go a little too deep on on this. Sometimes I was really worried. I was wondering wondering what the break point was uh, if you were adding this into my my example in the AdventureWorks database. Um, at what point? How many updates would you have to skip in order for this to uh, come out ahead? So, as I said, when I run my example. Uh, the more I run it, the more the average runtime comes down. I actually uh, worked with this one afternoon, kept running it, kept running it. And the average runtime for the stored procedure, uh, the normal stored procedure, the normal update, came down to about two milliseconds. I said, okay. The overhead for my memory optimized queries was about 70 microseconds. So how much of the time would we need to skip the update operation in order to have actually saved ourselves some time? Did a little bit of algebra and what I came up with if we skip the update operation three and a half percent of the time, we should come out ahead on my example on this system. But to me, it says that these writing operations are really expensive and it's worth the time to do this in a place where you think you might have redundant, uh, redundant data being passed in and updated multiple times. So a uh, few things to say at the end. I did want to thank Deborah Melkin. Uh, Deborah gave me a lot of feedback and advice on this presentation. And so I really appreciate her contribution on this. Um, she met with a couple of times and so that was really wonderful of her. Um, I, I referenced a few things during my talk. I talked about the Halloween problem a couple of times. Um, I have a blog post on the Halloween problem that I put up after I ran into this. But I referenced in that, I referenced Paul White who had a series of posts on the Halloween problem giving really, uh, well thought out examples of insert statements and merge statements and deletes and updates where you can see the Halloween problem. So um, I didn't wanna go about reinventing the wheel. So I thought I'd point you to a whole, all of his work on that subject. Second, Aaron Bertrand had a really good blog post a couple of years ago on upsert co coding patterns. And he had some suggestions on ways you can optimize things and make them faster. And I wasn't aware of some of these. So I wanted to pass those along so uh, if you are working on this kind of procedure, you might want to refer to those as well and see what else you can learn. Um, I've got links for my blog for my blog on the Halloween problem, blocking operators, which was the first uh, blog post that I put up on my uh, on my current blog. This actually came from Grant Fritchie got mentioned earlier <laughs> when he uh, when he came and uh, spoke with us for a day. We were looking at some execution plan at, that he had an example of, and he said, well, it does this and it does this, but there's a blocking pattern, there's a blocking operator here, this sort operation. And I had at that point worked on SQL Server for 15 years, and I'd never heard someone use the phrase blocking operators. So I, I went into this with him, and, I, and after I went and did some reading on the subject, that was my first blog post that I wrote a couple of years ago. And I also have a blog post on this topic itself. Um, if you're not really familiar with TVPs or memory optimized table variables, I'm pointing you to the documentation. You can go take a look at those and see what the restrictions and the limitations of those are. Uh, there are some such as uh, cross, database, uh, cross database transactions. You can't do cross database transactions when you're using memory optimized table variables, which leads to a little bit of uh, uh, having to think about things very carefully in some cases. I also have links to a couple of a couple of other things on GitHub. One is the QDS toolbox. This was something that a couple of my coworkers have put together that they shared uh, through Channel Advisor. I've done a couple of blog posts about uh, QDS toolbox, and I've got a few more that I want to write. I also have a link to my presentation slides and examples, which you would have to have downloaded my slides to see all of these links in any case. This is up on GitHub. I actually shared the link at the beginning of this, uh, GitHub slash SQL Jared. You can see my all my example scripts, my slide deck for this presentation, my slide deck for the other presentation that I will typically give out. Um, and you can follow up with me on Twitter, or you can check out my blog if you have any further questions. I must have been speaking fast. I'm ahead of schedule. I'm very sorry. Well, and there was <laughs> one more question that came in there at the end there too, which was- What do we have? Um, how often were the were the plans reused, or did you run into issues about around recompilation? We did not run into any issues with recompilation. Um, 
I think in part, so the main concern here was the update statement. At the point I was done with this, I did have an index hint on the, on the um, physical table so that we would always hit the clustered primary key. And that being said, we probably didn't have a lot of different execution plans that SQL Server uh, was going to try at that point. It might have joined things in slightly different order, but um, recompilation is not a thing that we ran into on this. Uh, and then, am I still, okay, good. I didn't accidentally mute myself again. Um, were there any sort of uh, considerations for the placement of the memory optimized file group? Um, not that I am aware of, um, because we're not actually writing a physical thing. You do have to give it a location. You have to give it a file. I, I get all that. I don't know how much that affects the outcome because we're not actually writing the thing physically to the disk. We just need to have the file, I think, for the logically hand logical handling that SQL Server um, does internally. Um, and I actually didn't end up in our in our production work. I didn't create the memory optimized file groups or or place them because they're already in place. We've had um, we've had memory optimized uh, objects for a while, and we have a completely separate database administrator team that is separate from our database engineering team. So uh, that would have been something that our DBAs actually did. But I would say in general that recompilations aren't a thing that we typically run into as being a big problem. Yeah. Uh, scrolling back. Oh, nope, that's Hugo also responding to the question about execution plans. All right. No, that was that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> well, I was really proud of this work. Um, we we went well beyond the intended goal for this one. And we ended up doing several things that I had never done before and they worked out really well. Um, it, but I also think it's really valuable to, to include the bits that, hey, we tried this thing and it completely didn't work. And here, here was what we learned from that because those can be learning experiences too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I guess we're wrapping up a little bit early. Yeah. Uh, the recording recordings, I think, end up out on YouTube. I believe there's like a group by channel. I don't think I'm lying when I say that. Mm. Hugo's point is a really good one too, saying that with so many executions per day, we're probably not taking that thing out of the cache. Yeah, <laughs> that that is a valid point. Yeah, well, and I think the other thing too is that's nice is if for some reason uh, that you did see some variants in plans. Um, you could force it with query store. You could say like, no, 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 this yeah. is the best one. Just, just keep this one, please. Now, in our case, though, that becomes really complicated because, as I said earlier, um, we're doing this work across, you know, dozens of servers and hundreds of databases, like eight or nine hundred databases. So, if we needed to fix a plan, um, doing that in query store, we'd have to do it individually on all of them. So, oh, one wow. of the things I will do, and I'm, um, I'm a lot freer about using hints than I think uh, some other people are. But in our case, it's a huge benefit to have, say, an index hint or a join hint to fix the join order because it gives us consistency across a large number of databases. So I see those as being really valuable. And um, I use those more freely, I think, than most engineers. <laughs> uh, if it fits the use case, absolutely. Yeah, like... There you are. And also, if you're going to do stuff like that and take that responsibility of having hints in your code, test, absolutely test and verify that the thing that you think is going to work well is actually going to work well. Yeah, I, uh, I'm still like years later working on unwinding hints that were put in by a, a consultant in our data. <laughs> Why is this in here? Well, we don't know. Okay, great. Let's <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> document that. Find out if they're actually needed. But I, I, I love this presentation and I love having to go through and find the symbol for microseconds so that I can put it in my slide. <laughs> I love having to do that. I'm super, I'm super sad that my, uh, my version of um, Adobe InDesign finally went away. Cause yeah, I, I loved having my little glyph sub menu. <laughs> Good times laying out books. All right, then I'm going to stop sharing my screen.